I'm Lisa Tucker Gray. My pronouns are she and her, and we are Trinity Episcopal Church, a progressive, inclusive, creative community of faith whose building is located in downtown Toledo, Ohio. But now because of this digital presence, we are worldwide. We are thrilled to say wherever you find yourself on your spiritual journey, know that you are welcome and wanted here in this space or in our space where we gather in person every week in Toledo. This is also the middle now of our annual pledge drive, a time of year that we are intentional about talking about the resources that show up in our lives and that we are asked as part of our spiritual discipline to tithe, to give back some of those resources in order to support the ministry that we are called to do as a community of faith. Later on in the service, we will share an impact story from one of our members and talk a little bit more about how you can participate by offering a pledge to support this ministry in the year ahead. But now open your heart and prepare to receive the love that God has for you today. Welcome home. Siya hamba kuka nain kwenkos, siya hamba kuka nain kwenkos. Siya hamba kuka nain kwenkos, siya hamba kuka nain kwenka nain kwenkos. Siya hamba, hamba siya hamba, hamba siya hamba kuka nain kwenka nain kwenkos. Siya hamba, hamba siya hamba, hamba siya hamba kuka. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching in the light of the light of God. We are marching, marching, we are marching, marching, we are marching in the light of the light of God. We are marching. Marching, we are marching, marching, we are marching in the light of God. See a humble cook and nine quinkles, see a humble cook and nine quinkles. See a humble cook and nine quinkles, see a humble cook and nine quinkles, nine quinkles. See a humble, humble, see a humble. Humba see a humba cook and nine quick and nine quick go see a humba humba see a humba humba see a humba cook and nine quick go 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 see a humba cook and nine quick and nine quick go see a humba Humba see a humba, humba see a humba, cook a nine quick a nine quick cross, see a humba, humba see a humba, humba see a humba, cook a nine quick cross. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Disturb us, Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves. When our dreams have come true because we dreamed too small. When we arrived safely because we sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when with the abundance of the things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the water of life. Stir us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas where storms will show your mastery, where in losing sight of land we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hope and to push us into the future in strength, courage, hope, and love. Amen.
I lift my eyes to the mountain peak. Where does my help come from? It comes from you, maker of heaven and earth, who holds my foot firm on the path up, who's constantly present, everywhere aware. Look, with you there is no obscurity, nothing is dim, asleep, inert. To those who question and struggle, you respond, keep hold, give cover, so that by day the sun won't burn, nor by night the moon mesmerize. You guard against evil, unfold and reveal the soul. Guard my arrival, secure my departure. Now, always. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Jesus told his disciples a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The Gospel of the Lord. Be still and know that God is here. Be still and know that God is here. Be still and know that God is here. In the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. I want to begin by reviewing how today's Gospel lesson, often called the parable of the widow and the unjust judge, has been most traditionally interpreted over the years. In a nutshell, historically, God has been identified as the unjust judge, and the disciples have collectively been assigned to the role of the widow. So from that perspective, Jesus uses the character of the widow to offer the disciples, and thereby extension us, two valuable insights on the necessity of praying unceasingly and not losing heart. First, regarding prayer. This insight comes from recognizing even someone as lowly as a widow, one of the most vulnerable, unworthy, dispensable persons in biblical times, can make a difference by petitioning for justice through the power of prayer. And second, regarding not losing heart, this insight seems to be instructing the disciples of the import of persevering, of developing muscles of resilience and courage, 
even in the face of great challenges, believing that God will listen and eventually answer our prayers. Now, let me say before going on that I commend that traditional reading and interpretation of the parable to anyone who feels spiritually fed and encouraged by those insights. But for me, something about that approach to the text has never been terribly satisfying or helpful. In fact, it has been difficult at best because too often I have lived with what feels like unanswered prayers. And I can't imagine making sense of what it feels like to hear someone just say, if you just pray hard enough, your prayers will be answered as a kind of theology. So then I am left to conclude that either I am just not praying for the right things or in the right way, or that I simply don't have what it takes to persevere. And none of that feels very good or makes, makes much sense as a disciple. Also, here's another problem for me. From this perspective, God as judge is like a parent who finally, having arrived at the end of his or her rope, if you will, simply gives in and says yes to whatever is being asked whether that be extra screen time, or another cookie, or a later bedtime, or a mitigated result of, well, you fill in the blank. Only because acquiescing to the request or demand stops the annoying and persistent requests of the child or the petitioner. In other words, God simply gets worn out and gives in so that the widow will, quote, stop coming and wearing out the judge, unquote. That doesn't sound like an expression of God's unconditional love to me. In fact, as a parent, I know that's not unconditional love. Survival, perhaps. An exercise in patience, maybe, but not unconditional love. But to be fair, that interpretation goes on to draw out the point that Jesus uses this unjust judge to articulate how vastly different and more responsive God as a just judge will be to those who cry out for justice here on earth. Jesus says, quote, And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them, unquote. Now that actually sounds like good news, right? But again, I am perplexed and left wanting more because this seems to turn prayer into an exercise of fostering and perfecting a perpetual wish list focused primarily on our needs, our preferences, our opinions, and our wills. Furthermore, I find myself wondering, where are we left to turn when so many of our prayers for justice go unanswered? What do we do when prayers for liberation, consolation, equity, just structures, dignity for all, or redemption, mercy, and grace seem to fall on deaf ears? What about the active prayers of many who work tirelessly advoca advocating for the unemployed or the underinsured, the homeless or the abused and neglected, and those struggling with addictions or depression? What good is persevering in prayer if God does not act on behalf of those most in need? I have actually heard people say that when prayers are unanswered, it is God's way of saying no. And from that perspective, many a preacher today might be using the phrase, the squeaky wheel gets the grease to commend the perseverance of the widow and pointing out that in the end, she was indeed rewarded for her persistence. Again, I struggle with that approach as we continue to grow and expand as a progressive, inclusive, creative community of faith here at Trinity. Of all the things I do not know, and believe me, there are plenty, I do know that God is not rewarding or punishing any of us when health or illness or tragedy comes into our lives. 
and we are not being punished or rewarded for either our perseverance or our neglect of prayers, however we may say our prayers or live them out in our lives. That is simply a hurtful theology and not true of God's nature as I continue to experience it here in this community of faith. Week after week, we continue to welcome people both through our online digital presence here through Trinity at Home, as well as in person when we gather on Sunday mornings for Trinity at 316. During each of these gatherings, we are intentional to offer a kind of welcome that works to break down barriers and instead offers a place and a people willing to be honest and courageous so that together we can live into God's dream of a beloved community. I want Church for Us to be a kind of superpower not just a bomb for our weary souls, while it surely can be that, but also a kind of spiritual antidote, a way to answer the age-old question of all monotheistic traditions, the question of how could a loving God allow bad things to happen? It's the theological concept of theodicy. Harold Kushner's seminal work, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, is still the best source I have for addressing this issue today. He talks clearly and compellingly about what it means to pray for ourselves and others, especially in times of tragedy. Rabbi Kushner, who survived the death of his son at a young age, offers exquisite insight and compassion through his words and witness to God's love in our life. God, he writes, who neither causes or prevents tragedies, helps by inspiring us to help each other. Human beings are God's language. God shows opposition to tragedy, heartache, and despair, not by eliminating these things, but by summoning forth people to travel with us, to help ease and share the burden and to fill the emptiness. The God I believe in does not send us the problem. God gives us the strength to cope with the problem. Prayer is our vehicle of reassurance that we do not have to face our fears and our pains alone. So I have been wondering, In light of Rabbi Kushner's reminder that prayer is not about crafting just the right words or request setting us up to be rewarded or disappointed, if maybe, just maybe, there might be a different way of reading today's parable. And then I found my answer in a book I had forgotten all about. Over 20 years ago, theologian and wonderful storyteller Megan McKenna offered fresh readings of 10 particular parables in the Bible. So I dusted off my copy of Parables, the Arrows of God, and looked up this parable from Luke today. And there I found what I was looking for. In the very middle of a very long and dense chapter, I found a very different and for me a very exciting new way of approaching today's reading. And of course, because most of our deepest truths can only be pointed to, it was offered through a story. McKenna recounts it happened while visiting and teaching in a small faith community in Chiapas, Mexico. One evening, while sitting with a group studying scripture and praying, a woman who had never spoken in the group before asked for permission to speak. McKenna shares what happened like this. A beautiful, fragile, elderly woman slowly stood and spoke of being a widow. She spoke of going to a judge just like the one in the parable we had just read. There she pleaded for her rights to find out why her son had been arrested and taken away weeks ago. She hounded the judge day and night. She watched him. She followed him, learned his schedule. She approached him every chance she had 
she had nothing to lose. She had already lost her husband and her other children. She was desperate. She grew to hate him. She prayed to God the same way while she pleaded and begged and got angry at the judge. And then, she said, as she listened to today's parable, she realized she had misunderstood this parable all her life. And she realized for the first time that she was the judge and God was the widow. McKenna goes on in great detail explaining how this reassignment of characters in the parable was a revelation for her as well. Thinking about it, the woman as the judge and the widow as God broke open a place in her heart. And in reading it, I am beginning to feel the same way. You see, reading the parable this way reorients God's relationship to us as the love we can never get away from. It is as if God, the source of all love, is always chasing after us, whether we like it or not. I have a wonderful brass plaque in my office that my mother gave me years ago with words from Psalm 111, verse 10. It simply says, Bidden or not bidden, God is present. I see it every day, and I'm grateful for the simple and profound reminder that the same message is how I now hear and think about when I believe that God perhaps is the persistent widow in today's parable. It's also helpful as a reminder as we continue to move through this year's annual pledge drive and our theme encouraging us to imagine more than enough. It is a call to each of us as disciples to work on melting the hard places in our hearts, like the judge who needs to be worn down. I believe God, love, can get into even the smallest of cracks in our lives, using whatever means necessary and showing up in the most unlikely circumstances, no matter what our prayers look like or sound like. So what would happen in each of our lives if this parable could help us imagine that we are more than enough? And even on those not bidden days, we can be comforted knowing that God does not forget about us, that God's love, whatever that looks like and feels like on any given day in our lives, is like a constant and as constant as the air we breathe. And thank God, literally, that the truth is not dependent on any of our abilities to summon God's presence or even our abilities to believe it every day. In the end, bad things will still happen to all of us, and no amount of persistent prayer can isolate us from that kind of pain and heartache. But it is also equally true that the power of prayer is real and palpable when it is a path leading us to connection and compassion and a deeper sense of community. Over the years, I have seen time and time again how prayer in this community changes lives. Together, we find strength to bear what would otherwise be unbearable. We find humble moments to give thanks for the gifts of life and healing and restoration of relationships. Prayer brings us closer to each other and therefore God's presence and persistent desire for us to embrace a posture of belief that there is indeed more than enough. So on this day, we give thanks to God that like the widow, the widow who will never ever abandon us, and will simply keep on coming after us day after day after day, bidden or unbidden. Because always there will be more than enough. May it be so. An affirmation of faith from shore to shore. We believe in God, 
the creator of all life and beauty, who blesses our journey. We believe in Jesus Christ, who lived as a friend and savior to all he met as he traveled, and who ate and laughed, wept and celebrated with them in love. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who rides on the gentle breeze, who strengthens our bindings, and who offers hope eternal. We believe in the church, which stands open to all travelers and bears witness to the everlasting love of God. Amen. Recognizing our gifts, our miracles, enable our ministry, serve our neighbors, and strengthen our community. We gather to offer our prayers with gratitude. We pray for the church, the inspiration and inheritance of our gifts of wealth, works, and wisdom. We offer prayers for all the leaders, known and unknown, who work tirelessly to make our love visible in the world. When we give out of our abundance, we pray for the world, your greatest miracle. May we who inherit this earth be wise stewards of creation and kind caretakers of all your creatures. We pray for those who lead our nations. May they use the plentiful resources they steward to care for the people of the world. When we give out of our abundance, We pray for our neighbors and all who need our love and care, for those who are marginalized and oppressed, those who are sick and those who are dying, for the lonely and isolated, for those who are suffering and for those who sleep on our streets. We pray for all of our Trinity prayer list and those we name now. When we give out of our abundance, We pray for those who have died. May they forever gather at your table of plenty, sharing their gifts with love and joy. We remember those whose gifts, bequests, and intentions provide inspiration and abundance beyond their lifetimes. When we give out of our abundance, As the crowd gathered to hear Jesus preach, shared two fish and five loaves, they discovered when their gifts were blessed, they increased and became a blessing to others. May the depth of our gratitude increase every day for the uncountable miracles and blessings in our lives. When we give out of our abundance, May we, too, reach within ourselves to share our gifts with the world so that our love overflows in a need-filled world. For these and all things we ask in your Son's name, our liberator and friend. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God. Creator God, long-suffering, full of grace and truth, you create us from nothing and give us life abundant. You give us new life in the water of baptism. You never turn your face from us nor cast us aside. We confess we have turned against you and against our neighbor in thought, word, and deed. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. Restore us for the sake of your Son and bring us to heavenly joy in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of love bring you back to all that is good in you. May you be forgiven of all wrongdoing and welcome God's grace anew in your life this day. And may God's assurance strengthen your resolve to begin again in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please greet those you're worshiping with today with a sign of God's love and peace. And if you're worshiping by yourself, peace to you this day. 
On behalf of Trinity's leadership and the co-chairs of this year's annual pledge drive, Kim Bueller and Jeffrey Albright, I want to say thank you to all of you who have already made a financial pledge for the coming year. We have three more Sundays that we are gathering in person and through this digital expression to encourage you to consider offering some of what your resources are in the year to come to help support the ministry we share. During this season, you can do that by going to our website and clicking on the link that is provided on the homepage, or if you are on our mailing list, you have now received or soon will receive our annual pledge mailer. And in that pledge mailer, we have information about this year's campaign and then a pledge card that can be filled out and then sent in. Whatever you give and however you give, know that your gifts are received with our gratitude. And now to share her impact story on how Trinity has changed her life, please help me welcome Trinity member Melissa Toth. Hello, my name is Melissa Toth and I am the soprano section leader here at Trinity. And what does Trinity mean to me? That is a wonderful question. When I started here, I was very excited to be able to grow as a vocalist. I wanted to learn different styles, um, be able to use different parts of my voice, and that's what I thought I was going to get out of Trinity. And I was wrong. <laughs> What I learned from the first rehearsal was that Trinity was a family and that everyone was incredibly accepting and just all around amazing people that quickly, quickly became dear friends. Uh, from the first service, I knew that this place was special and I made the decision very quickly that I wanted to be a part of this church and that I wanted my daughter to be a part of this church. And Milo was baptized here two months after I started at Trinity. Trinity is love. Trinity is community. Trinity is there for one another through all times, whether they be good or bad. And I'm just so happy that I found this place and that I am a part of the love here at Trinity. our glory but I will gladly join the fight and when our children tell our story they'll tell the story of tonight they'll tell the story of tonight Have you ever felt like nobody was there? Have you ever felt forgotten in the middle of nowhere? Have you ever felt like you could disappear? Like you could fall and no one would hear? Well, let that lonely feeling wash away. Oh, we see. Cause maybe there's a reason to believe you'll be okay For, for as 
yet, may your promises be kept. May you never forget that you are love. And the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, descend upon you and saturate your beautiful hearts this day and forevermore. Amen. giving God. Well, let that lonely feeling wash away. Oh, we see his love. Cause maybe there's a reason to believe you'll be okay. For, for us, us when you don't feel strong enough to stand, you can reach, reach out your hand. And oh, Tell you Someone will come running to take you 
raise a class to all of us. Tomorrow there'll be more of us telling the story of tonight. Out of the shade.